May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. I've only been working at Thrive Behavioral Health since November of this past year, and Reverend Scott asked me to kind of talk about some of the things that I see. But on some level, and I spoke to him about this, I think many of us are on overload. Many of us don't know what to do with all that's going on between the pandemic and lockdowns and isolation. And then we have the Black Lives Matter and the riots and the peaceful protesters. And so what I wanted to do today was not just let you know about some of the issues that my clients are dealing with, but to help you find out what you're dealing with. So I expect that what I will be doing today is I'm going to talk a little bit about mental health and help you understand what classifies a mental health issue as something that needs to be treated. I'm going to talk about major depression. I'm going to talk about anxiety. I'm going to talk about substance abuse. And I'm going to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, you hear that and you're saying, oh my gosh, she's going to be here forever. Well, I don't really plan on being here forever because I usually have to explain this to people fairly quickly. How many of you have been sad? Feeling like you're down or in the dumps? I don't know anybody who has never felt sad. But there is a difference between sadness and major depression. Major depression needs three things in order to count as major depression. The obvious one is that sad mood, where you're feeling blue, you may be crying a little bit more. But in addition to a mood change, there is a thought piece that happens with major depression. It's almost like you end up wearing really tinted glasses, like if mine had those transitions and it was really dark or I had real orange ones and the whole world changes. That's what happens to people's thoughts when they're in an actual depression. They start thinking that things are hopeless. They start thinking that they may be inadequate. Some people have dis difficulty concentrating, and some even think about suicide. Now, if this has ever happened to you or to someone you love and care about, think about how that needs to be treated. Because if I were wearing orange glasses in this room, in this sanctuary, everything would look so different. I wouldn't be able to see those that I imagine listening to this meditation. In addition to the thoughts, often what happens is people begin to lack motivation. It's like you've got this inertia going on and you just don't get pleasure in things that used to be very pleasurable for you. So you have the mood, you have the thought piece, and then you have an actual physical piece. And this kind of gets confusing for people because for some people they get really agitated. For some people, they just go down. You'll find your sleep, you may be sleeping oh so much, much more than you really need to be. Or on the other hand, you may have difficulty sleeping and you find yourself waking up frequently in the middle of the night or early morning, like two hours before the alarm is supposed to go off and you just can't get back to sleep. There's that sense of inertia that you're weighed down, physically weighed down. Your thoughts are slower. You may find that you're eating a lot more 
or your appetite is really down. Or you may just find that you're only eating junk food as a way to comfort. And I bet a lot of you are doing that right now. Don't think you're automatically majorly depressed. I think it's part of the pandemic. And the issue is not for you to diagnose. You need to see a doctor or a nurse practitioner or someone who can help your behavioral health clinician, who can help you figure that out. Because that's not something that you can just, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps and will away. Major depression is a real disorder. It's a part of the brain. It's almost like the, the cells in your brain, they're just not talking the right language to one another. So one's speaking French, the other one's speaking German, and then you have another one who's speaking in English and Russian and Czech, and it goes on and on. So you just may need a little bit of medication. You also may need some therapy. There's a wonderful writer, M. Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled. It's the only book that I know the first line of. And his first line is, life is difficult. And from there he goes on and says, once you realize life is difficult, it actually gets easier because you're not expecting a rose garden. Some people may feel the depression. Some people may find increased anxiety. That also includes both a mood and a physical component. You know what it feels like to get nervous and worried. You know what it feels like to feel anxious, like before you had a test or when you were doing public speaking or when you just were worried about everything. And in this climate, it's really easy to worry about everything. Now, when it starts to affect your sleep, because you can't fall asleep, because your mind just keeps racing, when your stomach starts getting really agitated, and you may have some gastrointestinal system symptoms. When your heart starts racing, and there's no real cause for it. When you just feel so revved up, you may be irritable and annoyed at everything. Someone may breathe too loud. That's anxiety. There are ways to deal with anxiety, and I will go into that this morning as well. The other thing that I've noticed, and I've heard a lot on um, the news, is the increase in drug and alcohol use. Now, be clear, alcohol is a drug. And the reason people drink and drug is because when they're anxious or depressed, what happens? It works. You feel better. But then as it goes out of your system, you get more and more anxious and depressed. So what do you do? Well, if I was anxious here and now it's up here, oh, I gotta take a drink, yeah. And that's how people get addicted. It's a vicious cycle. And it's one that you need to be aware of. So just monitor yourself. The other thing I'd like to describe is post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine when the riots were just beginning, and she said, oh, I'm so, I'm so revved up, I can't, I can't stand it. And I said, why, what's going on? She said, I remember when I lived in Detroit, and I was a little girl, and they were having the Detroit riots, and I heard them, I heard all the noise, and I went out and there was my father and he went and got a rifle because a car had driven up right in front of our home. And my father opened that door and stood there with a rifle and they went away. That brought her right back to her young self. When we're looking at looting and violence, it's scary. If you find you're having nightmares about some of this stuff, 
pay attention. If you're having, as my friend Pearl did, recurrent and distressing memories, it could be of a race riot, it could be sexual abuse, it could be a car crash, it could be a fire in the house. We've seen them all on the TV recently. Pay attention. The human spirit is an incredible It's an incredible indicator of what is going on with our inner self. So as you begin to listen and think about these things, kind of check in with yourself, be quiet, and see if you're feeling a depression or more anxious. If you're struggling with PTSD or if you're just drinking a little bit too much, Pay attention, because that will interfere with you being able to move forward and cope with whatever's going on. Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about today is something you probably haven't heard of. I probably didn't hear of it. It's usually applied to um, those who are first responders and behavioral therapists and psychiatrists. It's called compassion fatigue. Have you ever heard of that? Now, we're Christians. We want to care. We want to know what's going on in the world. We want it to get better. Let me give you a definition of compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue has been described as the cost of caring for others in emotional and physical pain. It is characterized by deep physical and emotional exhaustion and a pronounced change in the helper's ability to feel empathy. Are you feeling overwhelmed? I know sometimes I do. Sometimes it gets so bad that it's hard for you to even make decisions. And if you keep watching all of these clips on the news and on social media, it can actually cause a secondary traumatization. Whereas you may not have had any of these things happen to you, but all of a sudden you're not sleeping as well. Your mind is just constantly thinking about them and it's not healthy. And God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be whole. Now this leads me to several coping strategies, and I'm not going to, this is not going to be an exhaustive list by any means. The first thing you need to do is limit the time you are accessing TV and social media because that just makes you more and more agitated. It brings on feelings of hopelessness. How can we ever fix the world we've got here? So limit the time that you're spending on those things. Now many of us have been socialized. I know I was to take care of others. Because what happens if you take care of yourself? How many have felt selfish doing that? That's a judgment call. That is not what God wants. Jesus says to love one another as you love yourself. It doesn't say love them more than yourself. It doesn't say put yourself down so that everyone else can feel better. Jesus tells us to love ourselves. I want you to challenge you to think of self-care and Sabbath time as being for self. Because if you can't take care of yourself, I as a therapist know this, if I can't take care of myself, how in the world am I going to model that 
for anyone. If I can't come up, come up to you and say, you know, I'm really doing the best I can taking care of myself. The fact that Scott's taking a little time off is vital. This has been a stressful time for the entire church, for this nation, and all of our communities. If you think of our ability to care for others as a river, there was one time in my life I looked great for the world, but what I was doing is I was working on the fringes of my being. I was kind, I was compassionate, I was loving, but I was not connected. I was not connected to the God within. So coming to know God, allowing God to kind of shoot that energy through you to others will help you become a better and more caring person. Remember what Galatians says. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness, graciousness, self-control. You can look it up. It's a wonderful passage. And God wants us to take care of ourselves. God wants us to love one another as we have been loved. There's actually a caregiver's bill of rights. Did you know that? You can look it up. You have the right to take care of yourself. You have the right to take time for yourself. It's important. It's important because God wants to use you. And when you're working on the fringes, you don't have as much strength as when you can open your arms and spread them wide. What kind of self-care strategies have you found helpful? Think about it a minute. How are you taking care of yourself? And for some of you, that's a hard question. You can take care of yourself by talking with others, with family, friends, and health professionals. For attending the after worship on Sunday get together that we have here at the church. By meditating by calming yourself down. And yeah, those little thoughts are gonna keep coming into your head. And just when they come, just let them go. Let them just go away. And allow yourself to sit in quiet. Maybe in prayer, talking to God. But whenever you're in prayer, remember you need to listen as well. Some of you may find reading helpful, fishing, Coloring. Have you seen those adult coloring books? Those are pretty cool. Because it's something that you don't have to think through. It's something to change the channel on what's going on out there. If you let it overwhelm you to the point that you have compassion fatigue, you're going to be run dry. Some people, for them it's singing or gardening or fishing or hiking. It's vital that you learn to take care of yourself. I have two more things I'd like to tell you about. There's a wonderful mantra that you can use. Um, it's from the Old Testament. It's be still and know that I am God. Now you could use that the way you hear it. Be still and know that I am God. Or one of the ways to use that mantra is to take the last word off each time. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. 
be still, be. It brings you right down. It centers you. And some of us afraid, are afraid to actually be ourselves. God wants to heal that. God definitely wants to heal that. And then the last thing I want to share with you is something I learned in a critical incident stress management course. Those are, that's for first responders, pastoral care providers, behavioral health providers, doctors, nurses, all those who come upon a critical incident, like a pandemic, like a car crash. And one of the, ho one of the pieces of homework that I was given, we were given, for this course was to go home and for our homework to name five activities for self-care on three different levels of stress. So you want to have five activities for self-care when you're just meeting some resistance for a or for a routine stress day. When you're kind of a little off balance, but nothing majorly is going on. Think of it. Five ways for self-care. When you're a little bit stressed. Just a little off balance. Nothing's too bad. The second five is when you need resilience for a knee-buckling stress. How many of you ever felt like a hit in the back of the knees? Probably from this pandemic. What are those five things? They may be the same, they may be different than the first five things. But they need to be better care for yourself. When you have that knee-buckling stress day, you may need to just watch mindless TV for a while. Or you may need to make sure that you're eating well, you're drinking enough water, that you listen to music, and that you don't watch too much of the negative stuff. That's the second one. So you meet resistance when you're a little off balance. You need resilience when you've had this knee buckling stress. And then the last one is you need recovery. Because at this level of stress, you're all the way knocked down. And what coping strategies can you utilize when it feels like the whole world has been pulled out from under you? And you're on the ground and you don't know what to do. It's not the time to call somebody who's really depressed. It might be taking a hot bath, or a warm bath, or a warm shower. It might be talking to supportive friends. It might be using that coloring book instead of trying to do a Sudoku puzzle. I mean, you can use it as your levels with some of your games as well. It's important to take care of yourself. Because God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be healed. God wants for you, you to take care of yourself so that you can bring that love out into the world. You can bring and fill the world with compassion. You can fill the world with kindness. You're not out of control because it's just too much. You don't have to be kicking the dog because you've had a tough stress day. You need to care for yourself. So whatever mental health thing is going on, whatever things are troubling you about what's going on in the world with the COVID-19, the fact that people aren't physically distancing the way they used to, the fact that things are opening up and you're really scared, the fact that you're away from your loved one and you can't get to them because they're in a nursing home or a hospital and they have COVID. The fact that we pray for our first responders and all our health care and mental health 
care workers. The fact that we have an uncertain future. But fear is the opposite of love and trust in God. May you work through these issues. May you find to calm that peace that passes all understanding. That's when you will know that God is with you. Because God's there all the time. It's the static that keeps us from seeing God. Amen.